Good morning. It's about time to begin our song service this morning, our worship service. We'll start with uh, We Bow Down this morning before we have our welcome from uh, Chuck in just a moment. You are Lord of creation and Lord of my life, Lord of the land and the sea. You were Lord of the heavens before there was time. Lord of all, Lord, you will be. We bow down and we worship you, Lord. We bow down and we worship you, Lord. We bow down and we worship you, Lord. Lord of all, Lord, you will be. You are King of creation and King of my life, King of the land and the sea. You were king of the heavens before there was time, and king of all kings you will be. We bow down and we crown you the king. We bow down and we crown you the king. We bow down and we crown you the king. King of all kings you will be. Good morning. Got a good crowd this morning. Thank you all for being here. See a lot of smiling faces. Got some beautiful sunshine out there today, and it's uh, it's sunny and all smiles in here. So that's wonderful to see. We do have our members who are unable to be with us this morning and worshiping from home online, and we welcome you as well. We still have uh, a lot of folks out uh, spring break and things like that, and so. Uh, we hope that everyone stays uh, safe until they return home to us. We will have a number of announcements at the close of our service, uh, but if you're unfamiliar with us this morning and visiting, we uh, ask that you please fill out one of those green attendance cards on the back of the pew in front of you and pass it to the outside aisle so we can keep a record of your attendance with us. And uh, also, we uh, have our communion at the close of our service. We don't pass out trays, so um, that's available for you at the back of the auditorium. Or if you fail to pick that up, uh, just raise your hand and one of our ushers will bring that to you. Uh, just a few things that we do need to mention this morning so that we can remember uh, in our prayers through our worship. Um, we do, uh, I think last week, Ronnie announced uh, a, a young couple that uh, wishes to be recognized as as a part of our family here, Jonathan and Jessica Pilgrim. And uh, uh, we do want to welcome them. And uh, Jonathan spent uh, pretty much all day with us yesterday at the, uh, at the outreach project. And that was wonderful to see. Um, we also want to remember our brother uh, Perry Britt and the passing of his mother and uh, his family. And, and as they grieve, Let's lift up prayers for that family. Let's also remember to pray for those families in Rolling Fork and in Amory and other small towns throughout this area that were hit pretty hard by uh, the recent storms and, and tornadoes. See what we can do to help them. We have been in contact. We've got several of our members who uh, took a trip down yesterday carrying items to them and uh, uh, been in touch with the elders at the church at Amory and trying to do what we can to help there. Uh, our outreach project yesterday was a wonderful success. I think uh, maybe 450 so uh, uh, sandwich bags were given out to our uh, area community. We had more than uh, 50 of our members that were there helping out. Um, as you can see from the, the color of my skin, I failed to wear any sunscreen yesterday. Um, but there are several of us that uh, were like that, but we were more than thrilled and happy to be out there welcoming our community. And uh, if you're wondering why I'm wearing a name tag, this was on my jacket, jacket from being in Guatemala uh, last Sunday. They do wear name tags down there, so... Um, uh, Earl, this one is, is for you. This is my name tag. Y'all know Earl's stance on name tags or, or should be reserved for cattle. But uh, anyway, 
it's good that we can uh, laugh as a family and, and be here and enjoy each other's company. Um, as we've come here today to worship our Lord and to fellowship and to study uh, God's Word, let's always remember our focus on Christ and what He did for us and the love that our God shows for us. And if you would, bow with me. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank You so much for this day. We thank You for the beauty of it. Dear Lord, we thank You for the opportunity to come here and worship You today. And as we lift songs of praise in Your name, may we do so in spirit and in truth. Dear Lord, as we listen to a lesson from Your Word this morning, may we take those words and use those to better our lives and our community around us and bring others to know the, the blessed Gospel. Dear Lord, we ask that You be with each and every one of our family members who are hurting and grieving at this time. Be with our brothers and sisters in communities who were touched by these recent storms. May we always do what we can to reach out and love them and care for them. We ask that You be with us as we partake in this service this morning. Help us to clear our minds of these worldly cares and focus on You and focus on the cross and that great sacrifice. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Ephesians 5 verse 19 says, Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. As we uh, get into our song service this morning, I just want to encourage everyone to keep those words in mind. You know, some, sometimes some of us, we think that uh, maybe our voice isn't pleasant to, for someone to hear, but it's pleasant for God to hear. And we're singing to uplift one another, and, but especially for God's ears to hear. So I invite everyone to join in the song service this morning. Our uh, first song to get us started, this portion of it is, We Shall See the King Someday. Though the way we journey may be often drear, we shall see the King someday. On that blessed morning, lives will disappear, we shall see the King someday. We shall see the King someday. We will shout and sing someday. Gather round the throne when he shall call his own. We shall see the king someday. After pain and anguish, after toil and care, we shall see the king someday. Through the endless ages, joy and blessing share. We shall see the king someday. We shall see the King someday. We will shout and sing someday. Gathered round the throne when He shall call His own. We shall see the King someday. There with all the loved ones who have gone before. We shall see the King someday. Sorrow pass forever on that peaceful shore. We shall see the King someday. We shall see the King someday. We will shout and sing someday. Gather round the throne when He shall call His own. We shall see the King someday. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go, anywhere he leads me in this world below, anywhere without him fear his joys would fade, anywhere with Jesus I am not afraid, anywhere, anywhere I cannot go, anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Anywhere with Jesus over land and sea, telling souls in darkness of salvation free. 
ready as he summons me to go or stay. Anywhere with Jesus when he points away. Anywhere, anywhere, fear I cannot know. Anywhere with Jesus, safely go. This one may be a new one to several of us, but the words to it are really beautiful. Purify my heart, let me be as gold and precious silver. Purify my heart, let me be as gold, pure gold, refiner's fire, my heart's one desire. Is to be holy, set apart for you, Lord. I choose to be holy, set apart for you, my master, ready to do your will. Pure Purify my heart, cleanse me from within, and make me holy. Purify my heart, cleanse me from my sin, deep within, refiner's fire, my heart's one desire. To be holy, set apart for you, Lord. I choose to be holy, set apart for you, my master, ready to do your will, ready to do. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we're thankful for the ability to come here and, and worship today, and we're really thankful for all the works that we have going on at the church. We had a great work yesterday that allowed us to grow together and to serve the community around us, and we have so many different activities and opportunities to grow and to serve, and we're thankful for having those opportunities, and Lord, we're also thankful for having the financial means to have those opportunities in the first place where we we oftentimes overlook that but we are thankful for that as well lord we pray for the elders to continue their oversight in all these activities we pray that we as the members continue to actively serve in these ministries and to grow together and to serve our communities around us as one unified body lord we pray that we remain unified as that one body Lord, as we have our, our service today, uh, let us focus on our, our singing and let us uplift one another. As, as Bruce just mentioned earlier, Lord, let us be focused on the prayers that we have, that we can be really focused in our mindset. As Carrie comes and brings a lesson, let us uh, take it and learn from it and grow from it and preach it to others around us, Lord. As we have the, uh, the Lord's Supper later today also, let us take a time to self-examine ourselves and to really remember the sacrifice that your son made on the cross for the remission of our sins. And as we have uh, the offering, Lord, let us remember that all things come from you and that we have uh, you know, the ability to even fund these operations because of you. And Lord, as we go to our Bible classes later today, let us learn from those, let us be focused in those, and, and let us figure out how we can apply that to our lives and to the world around us. Lord, we're thankful for everything that you give to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Some for the lesson will be, my hope is built on nothing less. If you're capable, ask if you will, please stand for the singing of this song. <laughs> Jesus, 
This morning's sermon is titled Communicating Hope, and the scripture reading comes from Acts chapter 27, verses 20 through 22, from the New King James Version. Now when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest beat on us, all hope that we would be saved was finally given up. But after long abstinence from food, then Paul stood in the midst of them and said, Men, you should have listened to me, and not have sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. And now I urge you to take heart. For there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. Good morning to the greatest group of people in Mississippi. We have a good crowd today. It's great to see everyone here. And I have, I must say, I have never felt more blessed to be with the greatest group of people in Mississippi than yesterday morning as about a quarter of you gathered together to pack and make and hand out barbecue sandwiches to commu our community in our Our Love Tupelo Day, which we have four of those scheduled this year. So if you didn't get a chance to be a part of that, you will have another opportunity in the very near future. We promise you that. But it was so exciting. We've even gotten Facebook messages and thank yous from the community about how much they enjoyed it. So for all of you who came, and especially for you fellas that spent hours and days cooking meat, we thank you all so very, very much. It was a, it was a great success. <clears throat> Tonight we're gonna be sharing some things from our Guatemala trip where we went to the ITL National Lectures and the graduation for the school last weekend. Chuck, myself, Lenora, and James and Chuck and James and I will be sharing some photos, and I hope you enjoy that. But before we get to that, that's of course tonight. And this morning, I want to talk to you about something that kind of was mulling around in my mind and always does whenever I visit a third world country. You know, we left the airport, it was at night, and we kind of took a, a quick bus provided by the, by the hotel to the hotel, and we got in late to the banquet, and there's some funny experiences that are involved in that. But then the next day when we started to go on our adventures, they took us for a little tour of the capital and the, and the city there. And then we went to another city called Antigua. But those who were with us, and there were a number of folks who it was their first time in a true third world country. The thing that I think impacted them the most is looking out the window at all the extreme poverty there are these giant communities on both sides. Guatemala City is built in, on, on multiple mountains and hills. And as you drive some of the roads and highways, you can look over across the valley to the next hill. And 
built onto these hills are all these tin shacks. And it just kind of strikes me every time that I'm in a place like that, the degree of hopelessness so many people have. Now, the part of that which may prove to be untrue is when we make assumptions in a place like that, that their hopelessness is a greater hopelessness or to a greater degree than the hopelessness we see here in our own nation. And we might assume that because we kind of default to, well, people who have more physical resources or monetary resources are not going to be as unhappy or as hopeless as people who struggle to have enough to eat or have a place to live. And indeed, there are things, I mean, I've heard it said before that a person can be happy being rich or being poor, but then the person who said that said, but if I have my choice, I'd rather be rich. You know, that's what they said, something like that. But it's true, Paul said, I have learned to be content in all things. I've had much, I've had plenty, and I've had nothing. But you can be content in all things. But the reverse of that is true. You can be hopeless in both distinct types of environments. You can still experience despair. And we know this because we live in a nation that's probably the most affluent nation that's ever existed on the face of the earth. And we have people who commit suicide. Our suicide rate is absolutely atrocious. We have a divorce rate that beats every third world country. We have people who take more antidepressants than people in those third world countries do. And you might say, well, but, you know, they don't have access to it. Yes, they do, because in Guatemala, you can walk in any drugstore and buy any drug without a prescription. They have access to it. And we still have higher degrees of depression and despair. And let's be honest, there's something wrong with our society because we hear about school shootings every three or four weeks or months. So something's going on. And the affluence does not take away the despair. It does not take away the hopelessness. And if we're going to talk this year, we're talking about reaching up and reaching in and reaching across and reaching out. We're trying to live out that stronger together motto as we reach out in evangelism to this community and across the globe. But what are we going to tell them? What are we going to communicate? And to answer that question, we would, of course, naturally say, well, we're going to tell them the gospel, the good news. And it is good news. But why is it good news? Why would they even be interested in that message? Because people need to hear a message of hope. When they feel like their life is going nowhere, when they feel that despair overshadowing their days and nights, when they feel like there's no way out of whatever circumstance they're in in their life, be it real or be it imaginary, people struggle all around us every day in the third world and in the first world with hopelessness. And we need to realize that to be called to share the good news, the message of Jesus, is that we are called to be communicators of hope. We need to communicate hope. We need to be able to express it to people, to give it to them, to impress it upon their lives of despair. It was many years ago, there was a news article that was run all over the nation, this tragic story of nine coal miners that was, were trapped deep under their mine in West Virginia when there had been a cave-in above them. And for hours, they banged and banged with their equipment, hoping that someone above them would hear them and be able to dig their way down. But as they banged and they banged and they made all the noise that they could, they eventually, it got quieter and quieter because they all realized the truth. They were running out of oxygen. 
So starting to face the despair and the hopelessness, one by one, each of them took some paper and they had a, 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 something to write with down there and they each wrote a letter to their family. And then the reason we know this happened is when they finally found their bodies later, they found a bucket that had been sealed again. And inside that bucket were the nine letters to their family. I think a lot of people today feel like those miners in those last moments when they stopped and they gave up on trying to be rescued. And they just gave in to the despair. They just turned themselves over to the hopelessness. I rest assured that most of you see people maybe even on a daily basis, that have given in to the hopelessness. They don't really hope that they're going to feel better, so they just go through their routine and their miserable lives. They don't really think that things are going to improve in their relationships, so they just kind of survive it. And they look at their life and their health and they don't really, they've been made a lot of promises like that woman who came and touched Christ's garment. They feel like I've seen every doctor and I've spent everything I have and I don't see any future, any hope. So they finally give in to the despair. People all around us experience hopelessness every day. But it's not new. And it's not unique. Look over in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And here we have Solomon as he writes these words that have become immortalized because they're just so true. And in one sense, they just observe the facts of life. But in another sense, because you'll know that all throughout the book, he gets to the last chapter, he mentions all things like money and he talks about relationships and he talks about success and career and every area where people try to find meaning in, in every one of them after he tries it he said it's meaninglessness after meaninglessness vanity of vanities but here he says to everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven there's a time to be born a time to die a time to plant, a time to pluck what is planted. A time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down, a time to build up, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance. A time to cast away stones, a time to gather stones, a time to embrace, a time to refrain from embracing. A time to gain, a time to lose, a time to keep, a time to throw away. A time to tear, a time to sow, and a time to keep silent and a time to speak, a time to love, a time to hate, a time to war, and a time to peace. Now that all sounds just like basic observation, right? Life is a cycle. So indeed, if things are bad today, they'll be better tomorrow, and there's some truth to that. If things are good today, they'll be bad tomorrow. There's some truth to that. There's a time for everything. But understand the context in which he writes it. Because as we move to verse 9, he says, What profit has the worker from that which he labors? I have seen God given task of which the sons of men have been occupied. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has put eternity in our hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. And then he'll go on and talk about later on that a man builds and then he has to leave it all to his son. He squanders everything he builds. You see, his point in this is he says God has put eternity in man's heart, but we just see this routine of life. We see it just continue on and on and on, and there's no escape from the discouragement and the despair and the hopelessness because even if you get some relief from the while, It doesn't last. The cycle turns again. And again. And again. And that's the truth of living apart 
from the hope found in our Lord. That's the truth of living without God in this world. As Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 15 when he talks about Christ being resurrected, he says, Christ is not resurrected. He says, we of all men are most to be pitied. He said, if Christ is not resurrected, drink and be merry for tomorrow we die. He says that bumper sticker is true. Who dies with the most toys wins if Christ is not resurrected. If he's not in our life, then it's just a cycle of futility. And it is. That's why what we've been commanded to communicate that great commission, that's why it is the great commission. Because we are a people who bring hope to the hopeless. Our task is to communicate hope. In fact, we could call, indeed call ourselves hope bringers. That's who we're called to be. He says there that God put eternity in man's heart. But yet so many people's hearts are empty. C.S. Lewis said it this way. He said, if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy. Interestingly, those words, nothing in this world can satisfy. That's what Solomon tried. And how many people today just get on the Instagram or the Facebook. I know there's no the in front of those young people. All right, I'm just talking. Get on YouTube, whatever, and look at these influencers, and it's all about the clothes, all about the trips, all about the cars. I mean, you'll find these young guys that are driving Bugatti, $2 million cars, and, you know, they're just presenting their life as awesome. But you know, if you're 26 years old and you got to have a Bugatti to be awesome, then you've got a big hole in you somewhere. And C.S. Lewis said, if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in the world can satisfy, no money, no amount of money, no cars, no houses, no relationships, no career, no corner office, if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, then the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. We're made for another world. You know what's interesting is people get very concerned about all the pain and suffering in this world. It's probably the greatest barrier to our conversion efforts. People who are like, well, why does God allow this to happen? And why does you, you do realize that if you've studied the Bible very much at all, you know that God's intent for this world was not the mess that we live in in this world. That's not what He intended. In fact, the world as He made it was beautiful and perfect with no pain and no, no war. No suffering. You know who made this world bad? Not God. Us. Mankind. And we have to be able to communicate to people that God is not the bringer of despair and hopelessness and war and suffering and the evil that men do to each other. God has always been the bringer of hope. And when He gave us hope in a perfect world and we messed it up, He immediately went to the drawing board to come up with a plan to give us hope again. Through Jesus. And so in the scheme of redemption, He said, alright, now i got this problem to deal with with people of sin. I can't be in the presence of sin. Sin will destroy them. I must, as the judge of eternity, Punish sin. What do I do? And in His divine brilliance, He came up with a way to both punish the sin, but save the sinner at the cost of His own life. Because God is all about our hope. We must be a people that communicate that hope. 
Over in that text that was read for us in Acts chapter 27, verses 20 through 22, the story of Paul on his Rome to face Caesar, and of course there's that shipwreck incident. And when it said there, now when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest. Now this phrase is, I have it highlighted on my outline. This is what I think is really important for our lesson today. He says, all that we would be saved was finally given up. All hope was given up. Just like so many people have given up. But then after a long absence of food, then Paul stood in the midst of them and said, men, you should have listened to me. By the way, if anyone ever looks at you and says, we say, I told you so. Well, it's in the Bible. The inspired Apostle Paul, and it's recorded by inspired Holy Spirit, he told them, I told you so. If you'd listen to me, we wouldn't be in this situation. But he says, and now I urge you to take heart. You realize that's all evangelism is, is talking to the hopeless and tell them, I want you to take heart. I want you to have something to grasp onto. Yes, it looks bad. But it's not hopeless. You see, we must be a people who tell the story of hope. Now, this is what we need to listen to. We need to tell the story of hope, not argue the story of hope. Not scream the story of hope. Oh, that's funny coming from the preacher who gets a little excited, I understand. But when you're talking with people about life and about Jesus, our purpose isn't to argue, it isn't to insult, and it isn't to prove that we're right. It's to get them to take heart. It's to get them to be encouraged. It's to get them to be able to see that there's salvation from the Lord. And that oh, as bad as this world is, this isn't the only world. And it doesn't have to be their only world. In Romans chapter 5, 6 through 11, Paul says some words that when we take them all together, they're so very encouraging. He says, We were still without strength in due time. Christ died for the godly. Still without strength. It's a hopelessness. He says, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates His own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have received the reconciliation. He says, there is hope, and that hope is found in Jesus. And Paul will spend his life communicating that hope. So how is it that we can help people to have something to take heart in? To grab onto? How can we communicate hope? Well, I think as we survey the struggles people have with accepting and believing in hope, there's three observations. And that is number one, we have to help people trust God without knowing when. Trust God without knowing when. That's very, very difficult. In Psalm 27, 14, it says, Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Yesterday, the, we, our house where we live managed to not be damaged by any storms. But I, we own a house that we lease out up in Alabama. And it was not so lucky. So as I was going through the drive through not Wendy's. It was a McDonald's yesterday morning. But I was going through the drive through I get a text from the person who leases our house and says, there's a tree through the roof. And he shows me a video. Oh, man, is it a tree through the roof? I mean, it is completely through the roof. It is a bad deal. So immediately, 
I picked up my phone and I called our State Farm insurance agent. And he said, oh, I'll get right on it. And then I didn't hear from him for like eight hours. And I tried to call him a couple of times and I couldn't get a hold of him. And I'm like, did you go on vacation? I mean, there's a hole in the house. I mean, and it was starting to, I was becoming more and more anxious. Now, here's the thing. I should have just trusted him because like a good neighbor, he's always there, you know? And he was busy and he had, you know, that area of Alabama got hit hard. So there's all sorts of claims. And sure enough, later on in the day, this lady from a roofing company calls me after hours even like, we've been talking to your agent. We're going to be out there tomorrow, tarping it up and all this. And what really impacted me as I was thinking about today's lesson is it's hard for me to wait eight hours on the insurance guy when I got something that's stressful. Isn't it? I must have checked my phone like 22,000 times yesterday. I mean, I checked my phone more than a 14-year-old girl yesterday. Because I was anxious, you know. And I wanted him to fix it in my time. But folks, here's the thing. Faith is trusting God in His time. And that's hard to do, but let me tell you, it's profound. It really is faith. Now let me say, I would have been much more worried. I, I was okay with it all because I got State Farm and they've never let me down in that. But if I'd had Joe's insurance that I found out you know, about at a flyer at a gas station, I would have been real concerned, right? Because I know that they're trustworthy. If I can trust them, you can trust God. He has proven Himself over. You want to talk about who's a good neighbor? Over and over and over. And He says, faith is being able to wait on me. Trust me. But I'm telling you, that's going to be hard for people in hopelessness because they want a fix to their issues today. They want that fix right now. And we understand it. We can empathize because we do too. But we've got to encourage people. No. We must learn to trust God in the moment and with every moment that comes after. To trust God without knowing when. Secondly, people learn how to trust God without knowing how. How? George Mueller has a quote that I think is very profound. He says, Faith does not operate in the realm of the possible. There is no glory for God in that which is humanly possible. Faith begins where man's power ends. And that indeed is a part of it. Understanding that God can work things out in ways that we just could not imagine. And if you look back, those of you who are faithful and have lived your life based upon that faith, I promise you, if you look back over your life, God worked out things in ways that you did not expect. Things that you thought were terrible in the moment turned out to be a great blessing later on. Right? And that's because we don't have to know how God's going to work things out. Hope is trusting God without knowing how. Philippians 4, 19-20 And my God shall supply all of your needs according to His riches in glory of Jesus Christ. Now to our God the Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. The only question is, do we believe that? We don't have to know how and we don't have to know when. And thirdly, we need to help people trust God without knowing why. Now I say this one because if you really go down the rabbit hole of why, why does God want to help me? That answer is a deep chasm of no answers. Because at the end of the day, we know God so loved the world. Yeah, but why? I mean, the whys compound. Well, because he created the world. Yeah, but why? 
Well, he, he wants mankind to be saved. Yes, but why? I mean, here's the thing. That may be the greatest mystery in all the universe is why. Why on God's part, from his mind, from his perspective. And, and I think it's important that we realize and help people to realize that they need to trust God without understanding the why because I have seen many of a believer throughout my life who never moved past elementary things or never moved past kind of the basic faith with which they start because their guilt is consuming or they don't believe God could ever really love them because they're dwelling too much upon their weaknesses, their shortcomings, what their life used to be like, what they continue to struggle with, whatever, and they're thinking about the reality that it isn't reasonable that God would love me. And it isn't reasonable. God's love is truly unreasonable. But I would say there are other loves that are unreasonable, like a mother's love. I've seen some mothers who love some sons who would be hard to love. And they still love them. That's the thing about love. Love doesn't have to be reasonable. So we have to recognize, help them to see and trust that God, God can give them hope without knowing why. No part of life requires more trust in God than when we suffer. That's the other part of the why. Why, God, am I going through this? Why, God, am I facing this difficulty? Why me, Lord? Why not? Why does it seem like people who don't love you at all don't have any problems at all? But I have problem after problem after problem. Why? Well, we're told that when we face life's trials, we have to look through faith. James 1, 1 through 4, consider pure joy when you face trials and temptations. Matthew 5, 19, um, bless are you when they revile and persecute you, rejoice and be exceedingly glad. Romans 8, 28, for God works all things together for the good of those who love him and called according to his purpose. And on and on and on. And all those verses are about this. When life is hard and you start to question why, you need to buckle down and trust God anyway. That's the message. We don't have to understand why He loves us and we don't have to understand why we're going through what we do. And we'll never find hope in trying to find all of those answers. You see, we live in a world of hopelessness. But we do live in a world where hope can thrive. And that's because of the dynamic that we've discussed a lot. And that is that any spiritual virtue, whether it's faith, submission, or real love, is only truly heightened. It's only truly visible when it faces its greatest challenge. As we've said before, faith is not really faith when things are going well. Oh, but it shines when things aren't. Submission is not submission when you agree with the person you submit to. It's just agreement. But it's beautiful when you don't agree. Real love, it's not love when you love the people that you're supposed to love. I mean, Jesus said, even the you know, tax collectors do that. If you'd lived today, you might have said, even the mafia do that. Love is really love when it's hard. When you love your enemies. And hope is most visible and given the right soil in which to grow and thrive the most in a world that seems like it's nothing but hopelessness. G.K. Chesterton said, Hope means hoping when things are hopeless. Or it is no virtue at all. As long as matters are per really hopeful, hope is mere flattery and platitude. It is only when everything is hopeless that hope begins to be a strength. 
You see, our task is to live in hope and to communicate hope. You're going to meet people that are filled with despair and hopelessness. But what we're trying to do is to reach up and reach in and reach across and to reach out and to communicate hope. This morning, if there's anyone here that hope seems like such a foreign thing to you because you've been in the throes of hopelessness so long, come and let us encourage you. If you need to come to Jesus, be baptized in His name. And I promise you, this very day can be a new day of hope for you. Or if there's someone here that's a member of the body, but you know we're not, we're not immune to hopelessness in this world. If you just need to be strengthened, encouraged, prayed for, come right now as we stand and as we sing. to the Lord's Supper. We'll sing low in the grave he lay. We'll do all three verses and then the chorus. Low in the grave he lay.
in Matthew 28, verses 5 through 7. It says, The angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who has been crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. On Sunday, the tomb was empty. An angel asked, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. If there had been an empty tomb, the world would have never heard of Jesus. The resurrection is the defining difference that sets Christianity apart from all other religions. Jesus was not reincarnated. He was, he was not recreated. He was resurrected. He went through death and out the other side into a new world, a world of new and deathless creation, still physical, but somehow transformed. <clears throat> Christianity claims that something happened to Jesus that had not happened to anyone else in history. Our Christian hope is not just immortality of the soul, but the resurrection and transformation of our bodies. Most religions have a holy place. Christianity does not. Other religions have tombs. Christianity doesn't have one. We have a risen savior. The, no man witnessed the resurrection. Who was there? Was God there? God did resurrect Jesus. Was the Holy Spirit there? Paul said that the Spirit raised Jesus in Romans 8. Were the angels there? We don't really know. Man was not, he was not there though. Christians believe Jesus is the Son of God because of an empty tomb. Christianity would be totally destroyed if one bone of his body had been found. Paul said, that I know him and the power of his resurrection. Jesus physically died and literally was re resurrected. This means that he is alive today. It also means that, he, that we can believe in and obey him. This is the gospel message. The Christian hope is not life after death, but life total. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. If you prepare your communion. <clears throat> Pray with me. Father in heaven, we're again so thankful for the opportunity that we have to come together to worship a risen Savior. As we partake of this loaf, let us always be mindful of what he did for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Pray with me again. Father, we're again, we come to thee thanking you for Jesus, for his life, for his death, and for his resurrection. As we partake of this fruit of the vine, which represents his precious blood that was shed for us, that we will have ever-living life with thee. We take it in a manner acceptable in thy sight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. That concludes our communion. We now take this time to give back the portion of that Christ has given us that we are, have been so blessed with. As you know, that we have a plate in the back that you can put your offering or you can do it otherwise online or whatever. So if you will, just take a moment to give thanks for that. Heavenly Father, we're again thankful for everything that you do for us, for the many things that we have physically. We take and give back that, and hopefully that'll 
expand uh, the bound of Christianity in a way that will be acceptable in thy sight. We ask this through Christ our Savior. Amen. It has been a great morning to be together and worship as our church family. And now as we bring our service to a close, we have a few announcements. Actually, we have two pages of announcements, so buckle up. And here we go. But first, we do have several that we need to remember in our prayers. Our prayer list is quite long, and we do have several families that are hurting that we need to be praying for. We have a card that says, thanks for the food, text, calls, and especially your prayers during my surgery. We could not have made it without our loving church family. Please continue your prayers for our son, Kelly. He is still taking treatments, and it will be about two months before he can have surgery. Love you all, Russell and Dean Wood. Also on our prayer list, please continue to pray for all those that were devastated by the recent storms. Uh, Nancy White, Daniel White's mother, fell down some stairs and broke her elbow. She is scheduled to have surgery. Evelyn Pritchard is at home recovering after skin cancer removal. She will have to stay in for the next few weeks. Diane Oaks will be having back surgery Tuesday. Also, the Williams family has been struggling. Lisa Williams has a heart test on Friday. Both of Elizabeth Williams' children's children have um, RSV. Her son, Lucas, has autism testing on April 11th. And her fiance, Jay, has a heart blockage. And good news, Claude's heart issues have improved. And please keep this family in your prayers. Also, another family that needs our prayers, Perry Britt's mother, Jean Britt, passed away. And Perry and Judy's daughter-in-law lost her mother suddenly as well. So please keep these families in your prayers during this time. In announcements, our community outreach project for March is to the Ukraine. They are in desperate need of any kind of baby supplies. Buckets are provided in the hallway. And see James Taylor if you have any questions. There have been some supplies taken to Amory to help with the disaster assistance. And if you would like to replenish the buckets or help in these efforts, please leave your supplies in the hallway. There will be no ladies Bible study this week. The study will continue next month and we'll use the book prescription for a woman's soul. And men, the list for April for those that are serving is on the table in the foyer. There will be a baby girl shower for Jessica Pilgrim today. It will take place from 1.30 to 3 at the face. And please join in celebrating as we await baby. And I love this name. Ginger Grace is our GT's arrival. She is registered at Amazon. Our West Main Loves Tupelo giveaway day was a success. We passed out over 400 barbecue sandwiches to the community. And thank you all to all those who helped in this effort. Our annual Easter egg hunt will be April the 2nd at the face. And that night after evening services, Kit Team will be in the fellowship hall. And one more message from our elders. For those wanting to become a part of West Main, please complete a new member form and an involvement form and give it to one of the elders to schedule a meeting. We'd like to meet you personally, um, introduce you to West Main, and find your interest to serve. Thank you. For our closing song this morning, we'll actually sing a couple songs. I've done this before. We uh, sing How Great Thou Art and How Great Is Our God, and we'll switch back and forth between a couple of verses on them. But they both have a very similar meaning, and that is just simply that we have a God in heaven that is great, that's always there for us, and really kind of goes along with Carrie's lesson this morning of hope, that without God, there really is no hope. Let's stand while we sing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, as we bow our heads, we acknowledge how great a God you are. We ask that you would be with us and give us strength uh, that as we study from your Bible, whether in Bible class in a few minutes or at home, let us be an example for Christ as we go about our activities, not only on Sundays, but throughout the whole week. We also thank you for the power of your word that we can have new members here at West Main, such as Jonathan and Jessica Pilgrim, uh, be with our congregation as we try to reach out uh, to this community. We ask that you be with those that have suffered with loss of a mother such as Perry Bread and comfort that uh, whole family. We ask a prayer upon Nancy White and her upcoming elbow surgery and Diane Oaks and her upcoming back surgery. And we're thankful that Elvin Pritchard has hopefully had a successful surgery and be with the others that have been mentioned. We ask a special prayer upon those families, those victims of Friday's tornadoes in Rolling Fork and Amory and Wren. Let us as individual Christians and as a church congregation help those people and those people that need benevolence, those victims that need benevolence, whenever we have the opportunities. We ask that you would be with us. These things we ask in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. <laughs> 